Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Round the Horn. The piano you hear in the background is being played by our guest this week, Mr. Terry Lawless, keyboards and sax player with U2. Hello, Terry. How are you? I'm great, Lee. How are you? Okay, we're doing pretty good here, despite all the circumstances of staying indoors. Although, we heard that some of the clubs are going to start to open up a little bit, but only outdoors. How are you doing out Great. in California? That's kind of what we're doing here. We're, uh, we're going outdoors and even into some parking lots and uh, places we can maintain distance. And uh, the show that I do is actually kind of built for reopening because I don't take any breaks, so I'm not out shaking hands with anybody. Uh, I uh, am constantly distanced, and uh, I don't have a. I don't have to stay spread apart from uh, people on stage because I'm doing a one-man show now. So that's great. That's great. That's where I am. Well, let's give everybody that are watching our show a little bit of your background. Now, you and I met first a long time ago when you were working for Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. Yeah, that was uh, 2000 at the E Street reunion. You still have the music store in Freehold. Right, yes. And, and Bruce, of course, is very loyal to uh, his upbringing. So uh, we used your music store in Freehold but quite a bit. Uh, he, he's a great person to work for. We, uh, we had a great time on that tour. And then afterwards, where did you head to? I went from there to uh, uh, U2. And I've been uh, the keyboardist and programmer with U2 for the last almost 20 years now. Uh, I think it's 19 and plus. Um, and then uh, because they, they, uh, the industry kind of is you tour to promote albums, and their albums are about three years apart, it gave me some time to go out with other people in between. So I did another tour with Don Henley, and I did... Uh, the Truth About Love tour with Pink, and uh, I did a little thing with uh, uh, Bob Seger at the end of his tour, and uh, it works out really well for me that way. How did you get hooked up with you two, since you're not British? Uh, <laughs> well, no, they're not British either. They're Irish. Oh, they're Irish. Actually, no, no. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, they actually... Uh, uh, got a recommendation from uh, the fellow that was doing my job before me had a client that had been his client for over 20 years and she was about to go out again and I came in as a replacement but they uh, they came down checked out a Bruce Springsteen show and uh, I guess I was okay with that and I had the right uh, um, I brought the right things to the table for them. Right. That, because, you know, there's a hundred guys that are better than me in so many areas, but I just had the whole palette together. Now I heard they have a nickname for you. They have what? A nickname. Well, they call me Terry World. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, be, because I'm usually, uh, because... I kind of think of it as they're the Broadway cast and I'm the pit orchestra. So I'm always over in another little spot. So that's always called Terry work. Okay. I heard that uh, somebody calls you the magician. Oh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> they can call me whatever they want. You can pull things <laughs> out of a hat. <laughs> sometimes, yeah. Let's not, uh, let's not overstep people <laughs> in my job. They're the stars there, and I just try to make it so everyone sees how great they are. Yeah. Oh, it's a tremendous band, that's for sure. Yeah. And Bono has somewhat of an affection for Asbury Park. I don't even know if he's been there, but he's mentioned it a few times with, I guess, the uh, Hall of Fame induction for somebody, et cetera. But, uh, well, they've snuck in a little bit, and they're big fans and big friends of Bruce. Yeah. Uh, when Bono had... Uh, uh, health problems um, in New York. Uh, Bruce came in and did a show with us, uh, stepping in to sing for Bono. So it's oh, all good. Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen that on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. on Times Square. Great. great, great show. Anyway, let's talk baseball. Baseball, you are from, now we're talking. You are from Iowa. I am from Iowa, home of no 
Major League Baseball at all. But there's that minor league baseball, right? The Iowa Cubs. Well, they do have the Iowa Cubs. Uh, of course, Cedar Rapids has the uh, uh, Cedar Rapids Colonels. Uh, and their mascot is Mr. Shucks. So <laughs> that, that's a good one, too. Uh, claim to fame, Mike Trout played there for a while. Oh, right, yes. Um, but uh, I was from the west side of the state uh, in the Omaha Conference there. So growing up, my big influence was going every year to the College World Series at Rosenblatt Stadium in, in Omaha. Oh, right. Yeah, sure. I bet you've seen So I saw great, everybody great come up through there because before they were great major league players, they were great college players. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, what was your favorite team back then? Well, being from the Midwest, you were either a Cubs fan, which I was quite a Cubs fan, but I think back then I – I leaned a little more towards the St. Louis Cardinals. Mm -hmm. uh, and then along, uh, when I was a teenager, we, uh, we got a team in Kansas City. We got the Royals in Kansas City. Right. Uh, but I'm a bigger fan of National League ball than I am of American League ball. Sorry to say. No offense, Lee. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, your I, I work for fans. the Cubs, so. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, uh, I just think uh, my biggest problem is I think your pitch selection changes when you know you have to stand up at the plate with a 95 mile an hour fastball coming across your nose. Right. And yep. uh, fortunately or unfortunately, however you look at it, you don't see that in American League ball. Right. And the DH, I think they're going to talk about getting that to be in both leagues if uh, if we start up again. Yeah, that's uh, that's a big uh, a big thing. Uh, but actually, I think the the, uh, the breed of pitcher changes quite a bit when you go to the American League, when he doesn't have to uh, be an offensive player as well. Right, sure, yes. Well, there, there were some, as college players, there were some that were good hitters because they also played other positions. I know Roger Clemens always loved to hit, even though he was uh, – uh, only, only with uh, he was only with one National League team at the time, but um, I think that uh, he said he always loved to hit, and it was a great challenge. Sure, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, you, you see some great. You, no one remembers that uh, Babe Ruth was a pitcher. Oh, absolutely uh, right. Sure, you know that's the big biggest example of that, but. Uh, out here in California, I got to say, I'm a hardcore Dodger fan because I lived down in Los Angeles for a while. Mm -hmm. The first game I saw uh, when I moved out here was uh, Nolan Ryan and uh, Fernando Valenzuela. Oh, wow. Yeah. I saw Nolan Ryan pitch against the Mets, and I I've told this story before. Watching him warm up, all I saw from where my seat was was – was Nolan warming up, and I didn't see the catcher. So he was in the bullpen and throwing, you know, actually when pitchers start to warm up, they tell a catcher what they're going to throw by waving their glove. Mm -hmm. So he's waving to the catcher that he's going to throw a fastball, and, of course, you hear the pop. And it's like, you know, hey, there's a 95-mile-an-hour fastball, and, which he could do in his sleep. And then he starts to throw some curveballs, and he waves that he has to throw a curve, so he waves to the catcher, and you again hear the pop. <laughs> and I think the funniest thing about it was he starts to wave as he's, you know, going to throw change-ups to the catcher. He waves that, you know, you pull the glove in and out, and then all of a sudden you still hear a pop. <laughs> and Nolan Ryan, Ryan actually, he grunted on every pitch which most people don't realize until they start to hear, what's he doing? You know, if you see him live back then in the day, there was a huge grunt every time he pitched, even though he was throwing maybe a slider or, or a, a changeup. Well, a lot of people don't realize, too, you know, there's so much history with Nolan Ryan. He played on the 69 Mets. That's right. That's right. Yep. He wasn't a big factor at that time. They were but, showing that uh, on TV the other night. He's uh, and of course me living here in Santa Maria, California. Uh, a 
home of Robin Ventura. Oh, and uh, right. we, we all know uh, when Robin charged the mound against yes. Mullen, <laughs> and, which always amazed me. Why would anyone charge the mound to face somebody that throws a 90 mile an hour fastball? The, the arm speed they got to have. I don't care who you are. Stay away from those pitchers. <laughs> That's going to be a hell of a punch. <laughs> That's going to be. He proved it, too. Ventura played for both the Yankees and the Mets. Yes, he certainly did. Yeah. And he's really big with uh, upcoming players here in Santa Maria. He's a great inspiration and uh, supports, okay. uh, still supports that to this day. Dodger Stadium is a wonderful place to see a ball game. Um, I didn't ever actually ever see a game there, although I visited there when they were on the road. And when you pull into the parking lot, people don't realize sometimes, unless they're there, that it's built into the ravine. Absolutely. And the, from the parking lot, you're actually at field level. And uh, then you see the ravine behind it. And I remember just walking up to the front gate and then seeing the field that I was almost on the field from the parking lot. Yeah, Other stadiums, it's unbelievably beautiful, even though it's now one of the older stadiums in all of baseball. Yeah, there aren't very many of those uh, old school stadiums left. Uh, I happen to be, because I've been on the road for so long, I happen to be very fortunate to have been in every uh, stadium in the United States. My goodness. And, and also the ones in Canada. But... Uh, uh, every single one, the last one being uh, must be Minnesota. That was uh, that completed the cycle. Right, right, right. So you remember, have you ever been in the older stadiums? Like, uh, did you ever go to Comiskey in Chicago? Absolutely. When I was a kid, you know, we, uh, we got out to Comiskey and uh, uh, I was at the original Yankee Stadium, of course, and uh, uh, going out to Queens and seeing the Mets. And uh, uh, I was at Tiger Stadium the very last game and saw people ripping the seats out and taking them home. And <laughs> nobody really cared because they were just going to have to demo it anyway. Yeah, right, so, exactly, sure. Uh, I, the closest I could get was way out in right field in the very last row of seats. But it was still a great game that day. You know, I, I played in an all-star game in, in uh, Yankee, old Yankee Stadium. And um, in the bullpen when I was warming up, the, they had an awning, a metal awning that actually jutted out. So, you know, if it started to rain, you could stay under the awning. But people would sign under the awning. They would put their autographs. And you could imagine how many Yankee greats were on that, uh, that awning, all the signatures. And when they tore it down, Jeter took the awning. So what a what a piece of history with that. And not many people would know it unless you were out there in the bullpen. Sure. <laughs> and well, you know, even if you didn't know about that, just to look up at the wall of retired numbers in Yankee Stadium. Right, sure, yeah. It's, it's they're like the rock gods of baseball, you know. Sure. I played on a, a, a field at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, uh, in uh, the middle of the state, Eatontown, New Jersey. And the field was actually designed by Whitey Ford during the war, when he played there as uh, entertainment for the troops. When he designed the stadium, or the little, it was a semi-stadium, he made the dimensions very similar to the old Yankee Stadium. The center field was 360, I'm sorry, 464. And he did that, I was told, because he wanted to make sure he had a job when he got back out of the Army and, and the Yankees would take him back. If they heard that he had gotten hit uh, all the time in, in, uh, during the war while he was serving, uh, he felt that he wasn't going to have a job when he got back. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's amazing. Yeah, there's, lot, there's so much heritage on the East Coast there because you, you have had baseball so much longer than we have here on the West Coast. Right. But, uh, but I'll tell you what, uh, you go into one of those old school stadiums and there's just such a great vibe there. Uh, you don't need a swimming pool in center or a hot tub in center field. And, uh, <laughs> right. uh, I remember when everybody was a little bit perturbed that uh, – 
uh, Boog's Barbecue out in right field, you know, they they wanted to keep its seats up there. And uh, Oh, right, yeah, at Camden and, Yards. Well, and in Chicago, you know, the, the people that uh, uh, are in the uh, apartments there are watching the game all the time. When they started building up left field there, everybody, <laughs> you know, people uh, still got that old school vibe about baseball. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, I think we got to do something to make younger people uh, enjoy it a little more. Yeah, unfortunately, though, there's there's some things that are going on today that I don't really approve of, like uh, multicolor spikes that look like clown shoes. And yeah, no like thanks. <laughs> uh, you know, I'd like to see something like uh, maybe a drastic rule change, like on a uh, – a walk or a block or a, a hit baseman. How about having everybody advance a base? Mm. Think about that. Uh, it would encourage stealing. It would uh, it would really bring the offense of the game around. I mean, they'll right. never do it, but yeah. uh, it, I think we're it's time we get some kind of radical change just to try to to bring younger people in because something about the attention span of, uh, of our younger generation and it just doesn't coincide well with baseball. Sure, sure. I know what they're proposing for the season, if it does start, is in extra innings to have uh, the team start with a second, a guy on second base. So, you know, a, a double could, could bring that guy in and, and uh, well yeah that's uh, that's like uh, overtime in football starting it on the 25 right. you know well they used it in the world uh, baseball competition so I remember seeing that there so I guess that's where the idea came from I you know I really enjoy watching uh, uh, that competition uh, I think it came about because they took baseball out of the Olympics and they needed a a forum for people playing for their their national teams. Right. Yeah. All the teams uh, were uh, the World Baseball Classic, uh, and I really, really like that because all of a sudden, uh, the United States has never won it. Uh, right. Right. You got you got Japan with three gold medals, I think, and uh, then uh, Caribbean teams. Uh, so uh, it uh, it kind of puts a perspective on on how players come to the U.S. and play baseball. Right. Uh, but you take them back to their home countries, all of a sudden everybody is on level playing field again. Since you've been on tour throughout the world, did you ever get a chance to see a baseball game in Japan? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I saw Ichiro play in Japan, and oh, he, no became my, he, he became my favorite player. And I still would go up to Seattle to watch uh, – uh, Ichiro and, and Junior play uh, up in Seattle. Uh, wow. Uh, Kevin Buell, who you know from working with Bruce, uh, told me a story when he was in Japan at a baseball game that since he had blonde hair, he was the only blonde-haired person in the whole stadium. Well, that could be. I've, I think I've been <laughs> to a Japanese baseball game with Kevin Buell. Okay. We, we loved going to baseball games together. Here's another interesting thing about Japanese baseball. When you break a bat there, uh, and it might only be if it's a significant game, like a, a playoff game or whatever, they, uh, they make chopsticks out of the broken bat and stamp it with the date that it was broken <laughs> and sell it in the swag shop. Wow, wow. <laughs> I know he was telling me about the uh, the concession stand had uh, in, instead of popcorn there was a uh, little fish salted fish yeah uh, and and uh, bowl of noodles those were the absolutely yeah uh, it's yeah. it's it's very textbook baseball there I'm sure he told you that too oh yeah yes exactly if a guy gets extremely, on you're punting him over yeah extremely textbook. Uh, and, and you couldn't ask for a better, uh, you know, take someone just to show them exactly how the game should be played. If you don't think outside the box, which right. they don't very right. much, but, uh, to me going to a baseball game with someone like Kevin Buell is that <clears throat> I would have to say that maybe certainly less than 5%, maybe lower than that 
really understand the nuance of the game. And sitting with someone like Kevin that understands it uh, was a great way to watch the game. Uh, like in the World Baseball Classic, when uh, uh, Chipper Jones was on first base and there was a single to center field and he dug out to get to third because uh, Sabathia was pitching. And with someone on third in a, in a tie game, he didn't dare throw that dropping ball. Right, sure, yes. Uh, because he didn't dare let it go past the catcher. How many people would, would think about that? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, of course, the hitter was sitting on fastball then and broke the game open just because uh, Chipper made it all the way over to third. Right. Uh, right. Little things like that. Yeah, with the uh, Korean baseball on TV these days, it's been kind of interesting to watch. In fact, um, what I noticed actually, which is kind of strange, I don't think they do this in Japan. There's actually two pitching rubbers side by side. And I guess you have a choice or it's something that you can help push off of. But um, they were they were side by side on the pitching mound, two pitching rubbers. I've never heard of that, Lee. Yeah, yeah I'm never, have to never look saw it up. before. And I don't know, you know, there, there's a few announcers that you're familiar with that do those games from they, they announce it from their homes, and um, nobody has actually explained that yet. So I'm going to have to look that up on on Google to see what the story is there. That's pretty it, interesting. It, I've never yeah, it's heard only of that. about three inches apart. And um, they're, they're one right after the other. And I think that they use that perhaps to get more push off. You know, like in the old days, you saw that pitchers really chewed up a pitching mound. And they wanted to get their foot into a hole before they, you know, before the rubber. You can't do that now. Pitching mounds are absolutely like solid, like concrete. But uh, back then, you know, you could actually get a little bit of push. I remember actually the reason that they brought the pitching mound from 18 inches to 12 inches because of Bob Gibson. From Omaha, as a matter of fact. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> he played in our, uh, our conference there. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah, Bob Gibson. What a great yeah. player. What a great player. Absolutely. In fact, uh, we did an interview with Mark McEwen, who used to be on TV. Uh, on WCBS as a weatherman and before that he was actually on one of the radio stations in New York City and we got to be friends from there and now he's on the Black News Channel but he remembers Bob Gibson and that was his favorite player for, oh, for the longest time. He would throw with the authority of an American League pitcher knowing he was going to have to go up and stand up at the plate there. Right sure yeah. And he didn't care who he threw at. <laughs> no, absolutely. He was a tough SOB, that's for sure. Yeah. Everybody said and, that. And you know what the rumor was around my high school, that our high school beat uh, Bob Gibson when they played head-to-head -head in our conference. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that's our claim to fame. Did you play as a kid? Uh, everybody played in the Midwest. You know that. Yeah. Uh, the... Uh, the tradition in Iowa is great. We didn't have a lot of great players. You know, Council Bluffs had Stan Bonson. I think that was our, our okay, great player. Sure, yeah. But uh, when I first got out of college, I was on the other side of the state and played uh, or uh, taught at a little school called Norway, Iowa, where they were perennial AAA champions because they graduated 21 kids and two of them made the major. Wow, wow. Uh, Bruce Kim, that uh, sure, yeah, I know. catcher for the Tigers and then managed the Cubs, and yeah. uh, Mike Bodker that pitched for the Orioles. Right, right. Um, right. That pitch. was the year before I came in. They both uh, graduated. They made a story about this little town of Norway that the the kids they didn't really have a football team. Uh, their basketball team, the tallest guy was maybe five ten. Mm -hmm. uh, but everybody got behind the baseball team and there was a movie starring Powers Booth called The Last Season and it was about how they finally couldn't keep the funding up uh, right. to, uh, to remain uh, a viable uh, uh, power in contention there every year, year after year. 
Amazing, amazing. Well, Terry, we're running out of time and it's been so good to talk to you and catch up. And I'm sure that we're gonna get a chance, hopefully in the near future to, to see each other again. That'd be great, Lee. I hope to get over, um, I'm not sure when I'll get to New York again, but I got lots of friends there. I got a lot of musical friends there. I've got a lot of people I've worked for there. And of course, uh, great cities over there. A lot of great baseball that, that uh, might mention that when I worked for Bruce, we even got to play 90 foot softball oh. at, uh, <laughs> uh, in Boston. Oh, wow. We yeah, used they to play, let us play on the field there. And Kevin yeah. Buell was there, as a matter of fact. We used to play yeah, there on time. Sundays. And uh, Bruce would bring the barbecue and uh, when Obi was around. And uh, we would bring the beer from the Stone Pony. So we used to have some good times. Well, Thanks again, Terry. Congratulations Appreciate. on what you're doing at the Stone Pony and with your Thank radio you. thing. Uh, keep faith there, Lee. Absolutely. You too, Terry. Okay. Take care. Good night. See you later.